around around that. Uh, transcription is starting, which is really cool, but I'm going to close that window on my side because I get freaked out every time I see it that it's starting to take down everything I say. Um, it's very weird. And uh, OK, so please um, allow me for the future posterity of the, the digital nation to um, welcome you to the second uh, seminar of the second uh, week of our Embodied Interaction Seminary Series. Uh, Guillaume started off the week looking at complexity in time series data. Olga is going to be continuing on from that. Uh, of course, her talk will explain what she's doing, so I won't waste your time repeating that. And I've also asked Olga if she'd give you a little context about who she is. But also from the conversation that's just started, there's an interesting tension between the concept and embodied interaction, which we've all been talking about, called tuning, versus, uh, I can't even say it, behavior change. Uh, and what that what that might mean. And and again, the cool thing here is that I know a number of you are also very interested in N of one design. So we're absolutely thrilled to have some uh, really innovative new perspectives that we're all going to learn about and learn from. So Olga, if, please tell us a little bit about your con your context that we can adapt to. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And of course. Um, yeah, so just to, to give you a bit of background, so I would uh, call myself an interdisciplinary scientist. Uh, I have a background in behavioral science and health psychology and also um, kind of one foot in um, human computer interaction. So my PhD research was interdisciplinary, um, looking at um, user engagement with digital interventions, how we can think about kind of defining the concept of engagement and also thinking about how we can design for engagement. Um, during my postdoctoral work, I've become more and more interested in um, kind of how we can better design for individuals and thinking about the concept of tailoring and dynamic tailoring, although in discussions with MC and others, I've also become aware of the concept of tuning. Um, so I think the, the purpose of my talk today is to um, sort of dig into the different uh, concepts and methods that are used in behavioral science. So I, I want to be quite clear on that I've deliberately kind of tried to take you on a bit of a tour through the different concepts, how they've evolved and what methods are used, and then I would also like to critique those and think about kind of how we can um, maybe uh, move into the future and maybe moving a bit more towards uh, tuning rather than tailoring. That was so fantastic. Then, Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I ask you to kind of bear with me and hope and come on this journey. Um, so then I'll just get started. Um, so. I also wanted to kind of recap some. Uh, oh, key actually, Olga, yeah. Olga, before you do, my apologies. Let me just invite folks when they participate during the talk, if you wouldn't mind using the chat that's in Teams. And after the talk, uh, Olga's agreed to, to connect on the Slack channel from time to time as well for asynchronous continued conversation. So if and as you have queries, and we'll have some time at the end of the talk as well. Sorry about that, Olga. I should have said that right off. Appreciate it. OK, over to you. Yeah, no, that's great. Yes, and I should say as well that uh, I would love to interact with you. So actually, do feel free to, um, I mean, yes, yeah, put things into the chat or, um, you know, just uh, uh, shout out your questions. And I don't mind being interrupted at all. So yeah, so, that, so what I first wanted to do was just to kind of recap some of the concepts uh, that Guillaume introduced earlier this week. Uh, when we think about health behaviours as complex. Uh, and I think there is now uh, plenty of evidence from different studies, mainly using digital technologies that can, that can kind of uh, capture um, health behaviours over time for individuals across different contexts. And uh, this research is showing that uh, health behaviours like smoking or alcohol consumption, physical activity, uh, that dynamic, they fluctuate over time. They're idiosyncratic in that uh, they differ very much from person to person. And also they're multifactorial in that they're driven by lots of different factors and uh, kind of intersections of factors that 
are also different for different people. So the where I kind of wanted to go with this uh, is to think about the next steps. So if we kind of buy into this argument, we look at the evidence and we think that, yes, um, health behaviors are complex. How can we then use this knowledge to then define interventions that can actually match this observed complexity? So that's what I'd like to think a bit more about. And this is something that um, behavioral science folks, health psychologists have been thinking about for quite some time. And um, I'd like to take you back to kind of the, the concept of tailoring, which was introduced, uh, I think, um, I mean, it's been around for a while, but um, Kreuzer and Ray um, have this really good paper on it that I would recommend you to look into, where they kind of um, provide the definition of tailoring uh, interventions. Um, so these are interventions which aim to reach one specific individual, so not kind of a generic health message for everyone, um, and they're based on specific characteristics of that person, and um, they've been measured through a formal assessment. Um, and what sort of tended to be the basis of these interventions is that um, tailoring would only happen kind of at a one-off um, uh, uh, time point and usually just uh, based on characteristics captured at, for example, baseline assessment. So tailoring according to people's personality or maybe a uh, sort of um, snapshot of people's motivation at that moment in time. But then, um, sort of moving on from that, uh, behavioral science people have thought a bit more about um, what I will um, uh, kind of refer to here as dynamic tailoring, um, which are interventions in which the timing, the content, and also the kind of form of delivery or the design elements uh, are all adapted based on multiple assessments of a single individual. So coming back to Guillaume, what Guillaume was talking about in terms of time series data. And this is quite exciting because it enables a shift in focus um, from kind of one-off assessments of discrete states, even though we know that they're actually not discrete states, but actually they're uh, processes that unfold over time. Um, but so I suppose um, what I wanted to then kind of invite you to reflect on a bit is that we've got this kind of idea of dynamic tailoring. Um, so what do current instantiations of dynamic tailoring look like, and particularly from kind of uh, one of the fields that I work within, so behavioral science? And then what development methods have um, are available? Um, and then also thinking a bit more about who is actually doing the tailoring. So here are just a few different perspectives on dynamic tailoring that hopefully will kind of help lead into a uh, specific sort of type of dynamic tailoring that's become very popular and you might have come across it. Um, so sort of going back um, a decade or, or so, uh, it seemed that people were thinking about dynamic tailoring in, in, in quite a narrow way. So uh, the first definition we've got here is um, assessing intervention variables prior to providing feedback. Uh, so, yeah, to me, that seems like quite a narrow way of thinking about it in that it's just related to one particular way of, um, uh, of supporting an individual by providing feedback. But then we have some, some other... Um, perspectives, particularly from exergaming uh, and kind of more the intersection of, I suppose, behavioral science and uh, game design uh, in that dynamic tailoring involves multiple assessments of the behavior and then continuously creating an, an optimal balance between the challenge and the player skill, uh, skills and progress. So kind of bringing in the concepts of um, flow here as well. But again, probably quite a um, sort of a uh, well defined, possibly a bit narrow way of thinking about it. And then moving from there and what's become known as just in time adaptive interventions, uh, we have a slightly broader definition, I think, um, in that um, these are a suite of interventions that adapt over time to an individual's time varying status with the goal to address the individual's changing needs for support. So given that this is quite a um, 
sort of dominant perspective in behavioral science, I then wanted to kind of um, dig a little bit deeper into um, just-in-time adaptive interventions, what they are and what the um, current state of the evidence is here. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, just-in-time adaptive interventions, or gist uh, they aim to provide the right kind of support to users, but also at the right time. So here we can think of um, the timing, the type of content, the type of delivery being adapted to either uh, micro or kind of meso or macro scale changes in um, people's um, capability or opportunity to do the behavior or uh, motivation. But also we can think about incorporating uh, past states of the individual into kind of the process as well. So um, really being able to to tap into kind of um, uh, the process itself in that we don't just start from a given time point and kind of look ahead, but we can actually look ahead and backwards in time. Um, in terms of the um, the, the uh, mechanisms or kind of the the building blocks of GIST eyes, so these are also um, quite well defined in that um, when people talk about gist size, they typically think about um, decision points. So this is uh, when to trigger support. Would it be, um, for example, in the morning at 8 a.m. or maybe in the afternoon? Uh, we also have tailoring variables. So um, on the basis of which um, psychological or contextual variables um, would support be adapted? Then also thinking about different intervention options. Um, so what specific content or delivery strategies to consider? So here we might think of um, goal setting or action planning um, or things like that. Uh, and then we also have decision rules, which um, might be in the form of an if-then argument, but it could be more complex than that, um, which link tailoring variables to intervention options. So for example, um, if my stress levels are particularly high, then um, it might be sensible to deliver an intervention which is kind of matched to that stress level and kind of focusing on um, coping with stress. And then also uh, the way in which these interventions have been set up, uh, which is quite different from um, perhaps other types of interventions uh, in behavioral science, is that rather than just thinking about kind of um, measuring the outcome at the end of the trial uh, and perhaps looking um, across the whole study period, but taking a measurement um, at the end of a six month period, um, in just-in-time adaptive interventions, we often talk about both proximal outcomes and more distal outcomes. So because we've got decision points at, uh, well, possibly multiple times per day, uh, that outcome is then matched to um, the de decision point. Uh, so we might be looking at, uh, for example, um, at step count in the next 30 minutes following the delivery of an intervention. So uh, I'll come back to this in a few slides and provide an example. So hopefully that will um, help clarify a bit. Um, here is one example um, of a um, gist eye, and in this particular case, um, uh, so this uh, intervention is, is called SMART T2, and it was designed uh, specifically to help prevent lapses in smokers trying to stop. So, um, can be, uh, or it's, it's easier for smokers to kind of uh, make an attempt to stop, but what's actually really challenging is then, of course, to kind of stay quit um, because. Um, Smokers have to manage um, withdrawal symptoms, but then also kind of um, cue-based cravings by sort of encountering cigarettes in their environment. So um, this particular intervention, so I just wanted to talk you through sort of the mechanics of the intervention and then also how um, the researchers were thinking about kind of um, how to set up the, the different mechanics, essentially. So what they did here was that they first ran a study um, which was using ecological momentary assessment several times per day to try to, um, to 
to capture um, what risk factors tend to be present when smokers lapse. And on the basis of this preliminary study, they then devised um, an algorithm, so you can see that at the top, um, which is basically taking the inputs from uh, those ecological momentary assessments and outputting a lapse risk score. And then we can see um, kind of the uh, what the app looked like. So when uh, people were actually using the intervention, they would then be prompted five times per day um, and they were asked about uh, their cravings, their stress. So you can see the variables there again at the top. Um, and then when lapse risk is judged to be high on the basis of this algorithm, then um, people would be sent a specific message. Here they're called a level two message. And if lapse risk was judged to be low, they're sent a level one message, which was a bit more generic. Uh, and then we can see the branching there for the level two messages. So when um, uh, when lapsed risk is judged to be high, then um, the level two message would be tailored to the most prominent risk factor. So whether or not that was stress or urge, for example. But um, th this example is just one of many and hopefully it kind of highlights a bit how uh, the study team were thinking about kind of making decisions. But what, what I want to highlight here is that there are lots of different questions for kind of how to um, how to make decisions about the building blocks of these dynamic interventions or GIF size. So, for example, when is a good time to provide support? Is it better to provide support in the morning or maybe in the evening? Um, what tailoring variables do we consider? And then what different strategies do we consider um, goal setting or maybe some other uh, um, other content and then also how is past knowledge about an in, uh, individual incorporated into these deci decisions so uh, for example if somebody has had um, a good experience uh, related to goal setting would goal setting then be more likely to be recommended at the later points or is past knowledge not really incorporated um, and it's also quite interesting to think about how to make these decisions. So um, on the one end, I suppose they could be theoretically um, decided on, or it could be um, empirical and kind of more data driven. So for example, uh, Smart T was using data for, uh, from prior app users to then help make decisions uh, for new users who were using the app. Um, but then we can also kind of think a bit more about um, who is that evidence from? So is it a group of people and is it kind of the average effect across that whole group? Uh, or are we actually using data from the individual to to um, make some of these decisions? So in the case of Smart T, that was based on group level data. Um, and we'll come back to thinking about whether or not this is um, or what what sort of consequences that might have. Um, so I was quite interested in looking into what the current state of knowledge looks like um, uh, with regards to GIF size and then in my particular field of um, reducing harmful substance use and particularly smoking and alcohol. Um, so we conducted a systematic review and looked at um, what stuff is out there, essentially, um, and how do available GIF sites operate? And I think um, I'm not. I just, well, I'm not going to talk you through all of the results, but I think what's what's quite interesting um, from this review is that only two studies out of um, out of 14 unique studies use data from prior individuals um, to kind of make decisions about the timing, content, and delivery of these interventions. And also only four studies explicitly drew on theory to devise their decision rules. Um, so it doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily have a uh, theoretical framework, but at least it wasn't explicit in kind of how they um, presented um, the intervention. So when thinking about what kinds of methods are available um, 
from kind of well looking specifically into the behavioral scientists toolkit um one particular method has uh been developed specifically to develop gist size or to optimize them and this is the micro randomized trial so um this method is particularly suited to kind of uh select or optimize the different decision points or tailoring variables used in gist size and the important part of it is that um it evolve, involves randomization um but that's just um when we're kind of um developing or optimizing um the technology so once it's been developed then it would no longer involve randomization and probably important to point out as well um just kind of anticipating thinking about how these types of methods may be useful for other people uh, across other fields is that I think it is quite important uh, to note that kind of this whole method is focused on um, causal inference um, and that's why the element of randomization is important but it may be um, maybe less of a focus um, kind of across other disciplines um, which I'd also be happy to to come back and talk to you about uh, but I think it's important to just make that quite explicit um, so in a micro randomized trial then uh, each participant is randomized um, sometimes hundreds or sometimes over thousands of times throughout the study period uh, and the kind of number of randomization points will depend on uh, the the frequency of decision points so I'll show you uh, a diagram later on uh, to kind of highlight um, and then also in these designs, looking at effect moderation, so not just whether or not um, kind of a given intervention is effective um, at a particular decision point, but also thinking about the um, either the past state or current state of the individual, uh, both kind of psychological or contextual, whether or not that influences the effects of uh, the delivery of a particular strategy. Um, can be done with this method uh, and I'll give you an example again later on just to highlight how this can be used as kind of an evidence informed or empirical strategy for um, guiding the um, selection of tailoring variables so rather than just um, uh, kind of theorizing that um, a stress message may only be effective if the person is actually stressed which sounds pretty sensible uh that there, there could be or this type of design can provide uh kind of empirical evidence for or against that claim so i'd just like to give you an example uh of um one of the first mrts that were conducted which um was to optimize an app called heart steps uh so this was an intervention uh that was um designed to increase physical activity and kind of the um, the outcome of interest was step count rather than kind of uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity or strength uh, training or anything like that. So steps was the key thing. Um, steps were measured through um, wrist-worn sensors. And then the, so there were a couple of different things that were tested here. I'm just going to focus on one because it does get quite complex quite quickly. So the thing to focus on here were um, contextually tailored physical activity suggestions uh, based on weather, location, day of the week. They were delivered via push notification. So you can see a little picture there. Um, and these activity suggestions were divided into either kind of uh, suggestions to increase walking or um, anti-sedentary messages. So the type of question that can be asked with this design is, um, so we can, so here, for example, um, when, is whether the provision of a contextually tailored uh, suggestion versus not providing a suggestion leads to increased physical activity in the next 30 minutes. So this is kind of the proximal outcome of interest here. Um, this is just to, to give you a bit of a flavor for what kinds of messages um, were provided. But um, so that so a kind of a database was. Um, developed at the outset um, with messages kind of um, tailored to the different permutations of 
um, the variables of interest, so kind of time of day, day of the week, etc. So this was a six week study um, with 44 adults um, and there were five decision points per day. So if you focus kind of on the, um, the first box um, with the observations um, and we start from there. So um, in kind of the, um, uh, the decision to, to provide a message or not, um, data were kind of used to first um, assess the person's receptivity to an intervention. So for example, uh, whether or not they were currently driving, because that wouldn't be a good time to intervene, um, or whether or not they were already walking, which um, in that case, it also wouldn't be very helpful to provide the message. So if the person then seemed receptive, um, they were then randomized um, to receive or not receive an activity suggestion. And if they were um, randomized to receive a suggestion, then uh, with equal probability, that could be a walking message or an anti-sedentary message. Uh, and then as I've already mentioned, kind of the, the key uh, proximal outcome was whether or not uh, providing that suggestion then led to um, an increase in steps in the next 30 minutes. So let's look then at some of the findings. Um, so here are just um, some of the findings. Uh, there's a lot of data generated from these types of trials, uh, but kind of averaging over study days and the different types of suggestions for both the walking and the anti-sedentary suggestions, uh, what they found was that delivering a, a suggestion compared with no suggestions, about uh, our counterfactual, uh, increase the step count in the next 30 minutes by 14%, but it wasn't significant. Um, but then when we think about what this actually means in terms of steps, um, so this was equivalent to 35 additional steps um, above the um, average, um, if we kind of average it out over the entire study period. And then also what they found was that the effects um, appeared to be driven more by the walking suggestions rather than the anti-sedentary ones. Uh, and then also that the effect of, um, of providing these suggestions um, diminished over time, so it wasn't kind of uniform. And then just to um, give another example of kind of going back more to uh, thinking about how these types of designs can be used to select tailoring variables. So in the previous study, they were already decided on beforehand. Um, but here with a slightly different or with a twist to the design, um, the, it, it can also be used to, to think about um, what kind of variables to use for tailoring. So the um, 2018 intern health study uh, was uh, specifically for medical interns and um, was um, uh, set up to, to help improve mood, step count and sleep time uh, in this group. So it was a six month study um, and uh, also kind of used the combination of ecological momentary assessments via an app and then also a Fitbit to measure steps. Um, and uh, you've got some examples there of um, what it looked like for people using the app. And each week um, in the study, um, people were randomized to either receive a week of mood messages or a week of uh, physical activity messages, sleep messages or no messages. Uh, and here is just a schematic of um, the design. So there was a little bit more complex than what I just described on the previous slide. So we can see in the first box that kind of at a weekly level, people were randomized um, to kind of um, one of four groups, but then every day, if you were randomized to one of the message groups, uh, there was also randomization happening every day um, to either send the message or not send the message. And then if a message was sent, uh, then equally split between uh, kind of insights or tips. And then uh, the outcomes were, um, measured every day and then kind of aggregated uh, to a weekly level. So what they found in this study is that um, 
what happened in the previous week, so looking at, for example, previous week uh, week's mood, um, negatively moderated the effect of uh, messages on the current week's mood. So basically, uh, there was a greater effect of the mood messages when the previous week's mood was low, which um, seems quite uh, sensible to me, I think. Um, and what they were then able to kind of take away from this um, study was that um, future tailoring in um, kind of an optimized version according to the individual's past week's mood score or uh, sleep time would then be uh, beneficial. Okay, so hopefully I haven't overwhelmed you with all of those quite technical examples because it does get quite technical uh, quite quickly with these designs. So I also wanted to kind of reflect on um, uh, sort of who is involved in doing the tailoring. Um, and this um, figure here is from, um, from a paper about personal science, which um, I really enjoyed. And I think it's, um, it's quite clear from the, the types of um, JITIs and kind of instantiations of dynamic tailoring that um, I'm seeing in my field is that uh, the individual themselves uh, are not necessarily part of um, kind of actively doing the tailoring. Uh, so when it comes to the selection of the decision points or uh, the types of content uh, and delivery strategies to try out, and also thinking about what a meaningful outcome uh, would be for each individual. So, um, for example, whether or not uh, increasing the one step count in the next 30 minutes, minutes feels like a meaningful outcome. Um, and then um, also thinking about some, some other uh, kind of broader issues with um, the approaches that I've just shown you. I think it's also quite, uh, quite um, important that kind of the micro-randomized trial design, uh, which is key for optimizing these um, dynamic interventions, um, they have been designed in such a way that um, the, um, the statistical modeling that is used to kind of estimate the effects, they are all designed uh, to estimate average or kind of group level effects. So it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they're they provide a good fit for each individual. Um, so that's important to remember. And then also, as I just mentioned, um, I think it is quite clear that um, these types of approaches rely very heavily on uh, researchers or clinicians, but they're not necessarily involving the person in the process and kind of in the scientific inquiry. So then um, let's think next about some other approaches that are available. And this is by all, all means not meant to kind of be exhaustive, but just to, to open up um, some thinking around alternatives. Um, so I know that a lot of you are quite excited about N of one trials, uh, and so am I. Um, so I think there are lots of good examples out there of um, kind of applying some of the thinking that's been used in the micro-randomized trial, but kind of applying it at an individual level. Um, so here is just one example, uh, which was um, a way to figure out what works for the individual. And again, this was a physical activity type of intervention, and it was specifically um, for older adults. And um, this one had quite uh, quite a, a simple design, I suppose, in that it's not necessarily trying to do any um, tailoring then and there, but it's more trying to understand um, what techniques seem to be useful for different people. Um, so here, um, older adults were randomized uh, on a daily basis to um, receive either a goal setting um, message uh, or to self-monitor, or um, both of those, or none of those. 
uh, and this happened over a period of two months. And then what they were able to um, to conclude from this study is that people did really seem to differ in that um, goal setting um, was useful for um, four out of the eight individuals here. Um, and self-monitoring seemed to be more uh, useful across the board, so seven for seven out of eight individuals. But then um, also kind of um, thinking about how to to marry some of these um, N of one uh, type of approaches, but with um, thinking from um, control engineering or kind of um, the machine learning field. Um, I think this is quite an exciting way to think about it. So um, trying to think a little bit more about um, given knowledge about an individual's past and kind of predicted future states, uh, but actually not just states, kind of thinking about the whole process. Um, can we leverage technology to try to optimize future support um, for individuals uh, through using some of these methods um, so they can either be kind of model free algorithms or model based in that there is an underlying um, dynamic model that kind of helps to make predictions about how different uh, psychological and contextual variables um, influence each other uh, but for given individuals or maybe also kind of learning from the group but then as more data become available to kind of shift to uh, more of an individual model. Uh, so there are, of course, some, um, some challenges uh, in kind of applying these. And I think that's also why um, we're not seeing so many examples yet. Uh, and that's that um, these types of models require a lot of data for each individual. So uh, it might um, kind of not be very suited for some health areas. So my own kind of area of interest, um, smoking cessation uh, may not be such a useful approach given that lapses are actually quite rare or that the kind of time period through which um, we'd like to support the individual to remain abstinent tends to be quite short. So a period of a month. Um, so these types of approaches may be better suited for kind of frequently occurring events um, and things that kind of um, happen in our daily lives a bit more, uh, so kind of activity or steps or eating. So with that, um, I just like to sum up and then hopefully we can have um, a bit of a conversation. Um, so I think what I um, what I was trying to to convey here is that um, we know from from a lot of studies that health behaviors are complex and therefore um, we do need tailoring approaches that can match this complexity. Um, and behavioral scientists are some of the people who've thought about how to um, develop these types of um, interventions and how to optimize them. Um, in the behavioral science field, they've typically become known as just-in-time adaptive interventions. Um, and there are a few different methods that are currently used, um, such as the micro-randomized trial, and then um, perhaps a, a, um, a bit less frequently N of one trials. Um, but I think um, what we can conclude is that a lot more work is needed to make progress on um, what it is that is being tailored. How is this done? Is it based on um, theory? Is it based on um, empirical data? And if so, is it based on data from a prior group or is it based on um, data from the individual themselves? And then also who is involved in doing the tailoring? Is it something that the person is actually involved in themselves or is it um, uh, mainly driven by, um, by others such as researchers and clinicians? So with that, um, I'd like to finish my talk and invite you all to engage. <laughs> Thank you so much, Olga. I've, I've taken copious notes and I know we're a small crew here um, live right now. Uh, I, I would have no problem filling the time, but let me open up the floor 
and and see who's got questions uh, right now who might want to step in. Um, if I may go first. <laughs> sure, just introduce yourself yeah. for the record. And Hi, Olga. This is Indu. Um, I am a lecturer at uh, ECS in Southampton. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, um, uh, actually, I, I think it's a very nice talk because um, uh, I have all, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I have always been uh, curious about uh, human robot interactions uh, in a longitudinal scale uh, across multiple um, uh, uh, interaction uh, and how, how, the, how the behavioral variables change across time um, and, uh, and also how the interventions actually have a have an effect on the engagement disengagement levels uh, of the participants uh, so I think uh, uh, I think some of your um, uh, uh, I mean uh, I, I think your research actually provides some of the insights into how I can um, translate that into uh, lo investigating longitudinal HRI um, uh, interactions uh, I think uh, I was just wondering. Um, uh, so uh, you said that for the re uh, for for implementing reinforcement learning, you would need um, a lot of data, um, uh, and then uh, probably uh, uh, if if you are uh, using rule based decision making or something, uh, probably it's more deterministic in nature. So uh, do you think uh, probably some sort of uh, probabilistic uh, models? Uh, maybe Bayesian inference or something can provide like a middle ground and have you started looking into it? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, it's really nice to meet you. Um, and um, let me ask you to stop sharing your screen so we can see each oh, other sorry. a little bit better. <laughs> sorry. Not at all. Stop presenting. That. Oh, there we go. Cool. Yeah, so, th so that's a, a really good point. Uh, can we kind of um, learn from um, prior knowledge about the world or about yeah. individuals? And yeah, I think that's kind of um, either Bayesian or, um, I mean, because I, 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 well, I think this is an area where I haven't actually done much work myself, so I might not be kind of, um, but I've thought quite a bit about it and I think, um, the, the, it is probably more useful to kind of start with some sort of model. So rather than mm. just kind of having an algorithm that is just learning um, from interactions to actually think about, uh, can we maybe build different models that are dynamic and maybe we don't need a specific model for each individual. Maybe we start off with kind of typologies or kind of people who tend to like cluster around uh, different um, kind of relationships between variables and then tuning it. Sorry, now we're using the word tuning for it. Um, uh, but yeah, to, to, as kind of as more data become available to start tuning those relationships to then kind of make better predictions uh, for individuals. So yeah, I think this is uh, quite an exciting um, approach. But then there are, I mean, there are of course some limitations to that as well. So I think, uh, again, just relying on sort of a, an algorithm or how do you then incorporate the person's own um, kind of, um, yeah, the, bringing the person into kind of the equation mm. as well would probably be quite uh, challenging. I don't know, do you have yeah. any ideas for how to, to do that? MC, maybe you've got ideas. Um, OK, so uh, really cool question. This I love your lab that you're showing in. The, this, if <laughs> oh, that's what you've built since bad. getting to Southampton, that's fantastic. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, uh, I would dream of building something like this in the future. <laughs> I, I, I don't wait. Um, <laughs> The one of the one of the questions actually I had for you Olga before I come back to the getting more of the human involved on the qualitative side instead of just the quantitative data points um, remind me it's this concept of future ghosts and it's a challenge right now on the wealth lab main page I think it's the fourth one um, about reflecting data back to the person is it seems and you can correct me on this please is that in all the MRTs 
that you presented, it is the designer who's deciding when to ask for, right? Yeah. What's the rationale behind that? I mean, and maybe we've been doing it all wrong, but in our studies, we tend to, it, when we're implementing, say, experiment in a box, and I can see George is around and, and uh, to say, you know, we ask, when would you like to have this question? Because like, we want the best data possible. So should it be before you go to bed or when you get up or after you finished your workout? What What's the time that you feel like is best to reflect on this particular thing is is that stupid have we should we force them into a particular time i mean i can get it like everybody's answering at the same time but not everybody feels the same way at the same time so so can you unpack a little bit the rationale around that yeah sure so so i think it can i mean that's why i was trying to make the point about kind of uh why has the mrt been developed in such a way and what are kind of the linked uh, sort of statistical inference methods that have been developed alongside them because I think if we're not making those explicit it's yeah it's actually quite challenging to understand why it needs to be in a certain way uh, but I think it comes back to given that um, kind of the the purpose of them is still to try to understand sort of the average effect so I think the uh, hard steps one is quite a good example that you kind of start off with thinking about like averaging across all of the study days for all of the people in this group uh, what seems to work on average which is very different than the questions that you could ask with like uh, and of one study because if you then start shifting some of the parameters so if we think about the decision points so if those are different for all of the people in your sample then you can't make the same inference basically i think i think it's as, as simple as that it's kind of it, it needs to be a bit boxy because of the uh inferences that people want to make from so our stats are too lame to be uh sufficiently organic in terms of this I think I well I th that's one way to put it or, I th or or there might be other methods like the end of one trial right. that's not trying to because I mean, the, we also need to ask the question: what, like, what's the, what's the reason for trying to understand uh, the like average treatment effect? Exactly. Should we really care about that? Is that yeah. how we optimize for individuals? And I think that's kind of some of the critiques, and that maybe it's not the best approach for kind of getting to something that's really capturing what works for an individual. But it's one approach, uh, and it's useful for kind of certain questions uh, however the questions that that i mean forgive me if i'm wrong but it seems like 23 additional steps in that half hour after an intervention is is not significant of anything is that right i mean to me yeah, it seems like it's in the noise practically yeah so so i mean uh well given it that it's takes into account some of the noise I suppose that's the signal so whether it's more is that signal meaningful yes but then but then uh it's also kind of like the average so basically it, it gets it gets quite complicated to understand mm -hmm. the results too I think that's uh that's at least my uh mm -hmm. experience of it that it's kind of what what do these these findings actually mean so if you've right. got kind of the declining effect as well over time so it was actually something like a uh, 100 step increase or 400 step increase in the beginning and then it declines over time so right. uh, but yeah I, I agree that it's probably not super meaningful with a 35 step increase but then also like thinking about how how do people then uh, or how does it translate into kind of building practice afterwards so is That's it just a cool effective question. yeah when That's Exactly. So it's kind of it's it's those designs aren't really answering those questions, right? Um, or not necessarily in the way that they're set up now. So mm. th those kind of uh, proximal outcomes that happen very close to kind of providing the intervention, uh, but there might be lags, for example, or there might be processes that take much longer to unfold. So uh, kind of internalizing something like um well 
thinking about maybe um, identity change or kind of how somebody moves from thinking about themselves as being inactive to being a sporty person right likely takes a lot longer so can it be captured within that time frame or can be it be captured by operationalizing the outcome within that like short time window yeah like what's the what's the practice trajectory and does it ever get to that person's place like mike jones was one of our presenters last week and he was sharing with me and talking about discomfort design that um, he knows people who golf every week religiously no matter what the weather they're going to get 18 holes in and especially at a particular age that long walk even as George Bernard Shaw said, I think that golfing is just an interruption of a good walk. But it, it, taken as such, they, they're moving. It's an athletic act. It's a sport. But if you told those folks that they were athletes or exercising, they would hit you with their bags. So it's it, it's just interesting in terms of those kinds of transitions may never happen. So I think there was something you said earlier about the MRTs um, that reminded me of the embodied concept around, you know, align the design to your aspiration. If you find out what the person's aspiration is, then then it might be more possible, don't you think, to ask in the in the trial, the MRT, is this how is this connecting to your aspiration and that notion of building up practice? It seems really essential to be talking about how is this contributing to practice as opposed to is this just having, I mean, both are important, but it'd be nice to see them both together. Are you doing anything to put them both together? I mean, so, yeah, I, I think it is really interesting to think about these things. And uh, I am thinking about how to put these things together, but I also think I'm, I'm not... Uh, yeah, I, I think it just gets so complex so quickly that uh, thinking about how to combine both but still kind of have... I mean, it, it, because it, it depends on the goals, right? So, uh, like I said, it is kind of also a disciplinary question of what your area focuses on and values. Right. So if, if the value is around... Uh, causal estimates of a treatment effect and mm -hmm. whether it's you know worth investing in from a public health perspective then the question is probably going to be about incorporating more of the um kind of person-based stuff into those designs but maintaining the kind of randomization and all of that or if the goals are different then i don't see why it can be a lot wider and kind of um, than that. So I don't know that I'm necessarily uh, smart enough to come up with a new way of like doing these things, given that it's complicated, but um, definitely Nick, thinking about sometimes it. Sometimes there's a problem in being too smart is you, you tend to get lost in the complication instead of just being a bullshit about and saying, what the heck, let's go for it. That's, yeah. I'm not advising do that by the way <laughs> i'm just saying sometimes ignorance is helpful <laughs> you, yeah, you don't know what no, to be like, sure but mc I, i'd be quite interested in like in your view of like how so how important is kind of randomization and having that like to be able to kind of attribute the effect of something to the intervention or like the practice rather than uh like how important is that for you, for example, or in the studies that you do, or like the experiment in a box framework, for example? It's not, randomization in that is not something I've considered. The reason, quite frankly, the reason I was so excited about your, your uh, and Guimont's presentation is, is like, oh, wow, how can we get more power out of the number of participants we have without pushing them to do more than they're already doing? So I think that's one of the most compelling things about it. And I wanted to learn more about it to see how we could start to leverage that in the context, though, of how does that help create these heuristics to build practices with? And, and but let me flip it back to you as our, our guest here, because I know we've had questions in the Slack channel earlier today about, please give it a go, how you see behavioral approaches versus 
the things that we, the models that we, because you mentioned models or not, the way we've been talking about tuning and especially perhaps the way Eric's been talking about, you know, adaptivity and context. So if you want to have a go at that, then we can say, yes, we asked that. Yeah, so, so I know kind of the the term behavior change can trip people up because it's not necessarily a great term or like, or thinking about how how does it differ from just learning something new right. and whether that's knowledge or if it's skills or kind of uh, the, then at like a higher level of, of abstraction kind of yep. maybe translate into culture or kind of these mm-hmm. broader things. Um, and uh, I mean, personally, I don't, I think I'd be happy to call like behavior change learning. I don't feel that, interesting. Uh, they're very like different concepts really um but then of course the it, i think it's more about that like a lot of the theories and the methods that we have available they've kind of fed into each other so because we didn't have technology to kind of capture processes mm. then people focus on snapshots and they focused on uh doing these experiments and thinking about kind of again a snapshot of um, people's health practices, kind of their smoking behavior measured at a month later and just taking kind of one-off assessments uh, when we know that these things fluctuate. So, and also, I mean, the kind of theories and models of behavior change that are available, I think what I was pointing out in the Slack channel as well is that it's quite interesting because a lot of the frameworks are more around um thinking about kind of different psychological factors or kind of contextual factors that uh, can be used to predict how somebody is going to behave in the future, uh, but at a given moment in time. But they don't really have much to say about the dynamics and they also don't have much to say about what skills or kind of what techniques could be used to help somebody who's not maybe that motivated for example to become more motivated they're mm-hmm. quite they're not built in that way they're quite agnostic to those things and so, yet that's what i would think behavior is talking about more is is how how well you know the motivational theory of change is how how engaged are you with with you know wanting to quit smoking versus not and that's going it doesn't matter what you learn if you don't feel like it it's really hard to engage. I don't want to take up more. I could just go keep going. So I'm just going to pause. Uh, if anybody on here has a, a question before we wrap up um, with Olga, please. Anybody? Okay. Uh, uh, right. George has the question. Oh, the George, chat. does he? I don't. I, I missed that. Okay, George, please go right ahead. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I feel like so inclined. You want to that. interrupt. Um, <laughs> when you mentioned uh, earlier about learning from a group, um, how is that sort of different from um, tuning yourself um, as opposed to self-experimenting with your own knowledge? How is th- what is the complexity about that when when you learn from others by when you see what others are doing? Is that yeah. a form of outsourcing if you are using that information to insource? If that makes sense. Yeah, that's a very good uh, good question. I think, I mean, the the way that I would think about it, but um, welcome other thoughts, uh, is that it that that's probably less about insourcing or outsourcing. Um, I mean, I, I suppose it could be a way of outsourcing in that you're drawing on knowledge from others to then kind of tune uh, for yourself. But I was thinking about it more about uh, it's interesting how kind of the default is more around group level kind of uh, knowledge, which we know doesn't. I mean, there's no average individual in any study. Nobody will kind of be the average person. Uh, So there's so much variability in that. So what are we actually learning about it? So it kind of if, if the aim is to better support individuals and uh, to self-experiment and find out what works, uh, then it seems 
yeah, almost like the, why should the starting point be to learn from the group? Or maybe there is a way of thinking about it. I know that kind of other perspectives would be that people are in fact quite similar. So maybe we can actually learn a lot from the group and just tweak it uh, because it's likely to to work for us. So it was more that perspective. I can see how it is also uh, could be seen as a form of outsourcing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was um, thinking as well. Thank you. It's that that it, yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to pause there. There's, there's, there's like, we got to have you back because there's so much more to talk about. And, and this is definitely a helpful complementary expertise to where most of us are sitting on more of the HCI side of the house. So um, thank you for our patience with our questions as well. And I anticipate after folks listen to the recording, there's going to be more on Slack too. So let me thank Great. you again for participating in our Embodied Interaction Seminar. And uh, Indu, George, um, for coming along and uh, look forward to the, the asynchronous follow up. And next week with looking and you're welcome to come, of course, too. Uh, Ryan Andrews is going to be talking about uh, food supply. Where the heck does our food come from and why? And what what can we do about that in terms of health and well-being, not just for us, but for the group, too? Anyway, Olga, thank you so, so much for your time. It's been a pleasure uh, having you. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great and yes i would be very happy to follow up uh, in conversation on slack as well so yeah thanks so we'll much see you all on slack real soon ciao bye